Hi, everyone. One of the defining characteristics of the United States has been the presence of a Western frontier. Throughout all of early American history, at least part of the United States remained wilderness, untouched by U.S. society. Perhaps the most significant explanation of the importance of this Western frontier came from Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. In his essay, Turner argued that the existence of the Western frontier was responsible for fostering a spirit of individualism and independence within American society. The continual westward expansion throughout American history had served as a safety valve for American democracy by easing class divisions within society and providing a constant source of new opportunities. However, by eight, the 1890s, all of that was changing, and the previously seemingly endless frontier was beginning to close for the very first time. So when the Civil War ended in 1865, there was still a clear line between the frontier and areas of U.S. settlement. And though the West Coast had begun to be populated by American settlers, a vast expanse of land existed between, which encompassed the Great Plains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Western Plateau. These regions were primarily home to Native Americans, herds of buffalo, and other wild species. There were very few white settlers who inhabited this region, with the exception of some mountain men who had, uh, such as, and fur trappers, such as Kit Carson, who had ventured into the region decades before. Remarkably, by the end of the 19th century, this frontier would disappear completely, with scattered American settlements in almost all areas of the West. Perhaps never in history had such a large area been settled so fast. So how did it happen? Today's lecture will look at the cause of the closing of the Western frontier. Well, there were a number of groups who were responsible for the closing of the Western frontier. Each of these groups settled in the West for a different reason, establishing a frontier that led to the West's development. One of the earliest groups to help settle the West were miners in search of gold and silver. The earliest and best example of this was the California gold rush in 1849. Within five years of the discovery of gold, over half a million people had flooded into California looking to strike it rich, giving rise to cities such as San Francisco and speeding up the process of California becoming a state. The California gold rush was su succeeded by a series of other gold and silver rushes, each one drawing settlers into new parts of the West. 59ers rushed into Colorado and Nevada to pan for gold and make a fortune. For example, over 100,000 prospectors joined the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, and the surge of people into Colorado helped found Denver. Meanwhile, the Comstock load in Nevada proved to be an even more profitable gold venture. Between 1860 and 1890, over $340 million worth of gold and silver were extracted from Nevada. These gold rushes led to boom towns that emerged all over the West and in areas ranging from Montana to Idaho to South Dakota. Each gold strike drew more miners to the West and helped close the frontier. However, much like the precious metal that these miners were seeking, the impact of the mining frontier on Western settlement tended to be hit or miss. Some mining towns like Denver and San Francisco turned into major urban centers, while other boom towns quickly dried up and became ghost towns. Now, a second group that helped settle the West were, uh, were cowboys and ranchers looking to take advantage of the emerging cattle market. Prior to the Civil War, almost no Americans ate beef. On the whole, Americans consumed pork, and cattle was raised primarily for its dairy. However, when the Civil War ended, there was a demand for beef to feed the growing number of Americans who were populating eastern cities. The longhorn cattle that roamed freely on the plains of Texas seemed to be the perfect solution, if only they could be transported to these eastern markets. The cattle frontier was particularly appealing to many settlers because the cattle and land were essentially there in Texas free for the taking. The creation of the Transcontinental Railroad caused the cattle business to explode because it allowed cattle to be shipped to meat processing plants in Kansas City and Chicago. A new meatpacking industry was emerging in Chicago, which was dominated by the Swift and Armor companies. These companies would become the meat suppliers of the entire world, and a great deal of their beef was supplied by the growing Texas, uh, Texas cattle frontier. This ushered in an era of the cowboy in American history. Black, white, and Mexican cowboys would drive thousands of cattle to important railroad terminals like Dodge City, Albaline, and Cheyenne. These cow towns were the final destination of famous cattle trails like the Chisholm Trail and the Goodnight Loving Trail. 
Between 1866 and 1888, over 4 million longhorn steers were driven northward along these trails and shipped to the stockyards for processing. For a time, these long cattle drives proved to be very, very profitable, but the era of the cowboy was relatively short-lived. The same railroads that brought cattle east also brought farmers to the West. As new farmers arrived in the West, they fenced off the open range, making it difficult for cattle drives and denying the steers access to the free public owned grass that they needed to feed. The long cattle drives were re replaced by much shorter ones as large ranchers were, cr uh, were created near uh, railroad lines in order to easily transport the herds of cattle to the buyers in the East. The last and possibly most important group to settle the western frontier were farmers looking to cultivate the Great Plains. The Homestead Act of 1862 began this process by offering as much as 160 acres of land to settlers who were willing to live on it for five years, who were willing to improve upon it, and were willing to pay a relatively small fee of about $30. Between 1862 and 1900, about half a million people, mostly families, took advantage of the homes that act and moved to the Great Plains. This migration to the West was only accelerated by the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, which made traveling out West significantly easier and cheaper. The railroads helped in the promoting of far the farming frontier in other ways as well. In order to pay for the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, the government had offered the railroad companies federal land grants. These railroad companies then turned around and sold off this land in order to make a profit. All told, over 200 million settlers bought land out west from the railroads and these railroad companies. Farmers, or sodbusters as they came to be called, flooded into the western plains, breaking up the tough prairie soil and making houses from the sod that they dug from the ground. Unfortunately, the land granted by the Homestead Act often proved to be insufficient to meet the needs of these settlers. The Great Plains, which were also known as the Great American Desert, did not have enough annual rainfall in order to turn a profit. And most farmers would need access to significantly more land as well as expensive irrigation systems in order to prosper. As a result, two out of three homesteaders could not survive the five years they were, they were required to stay on the land. Still, over time, many farmers began to adapt to life on the Great Plains and several innovations helped them not only to survive, but to thrive. For example, the introduction of new, hardier strains of wheat proved to be well-suited for the dry uh, prairie environment. And Joseph Glidden's invention of barbed wire allowed farmers to fence off their lands more easily. However, by far the most important innovation came in the form of federal irrigation projects that supplied water to all parts of the West. The Reclamation Act was passed by Congress in 1902 to subsidize irrigation projects in the West. However, for many homesteaders, these governmental assistance programs arrived too late. So those are the major frontiers that drove the settlement of the West. But there are several other important takeaways that we need to note from the closing of the frontier as well. First, most of the Western settlement that was occurring during this time period was made possible by the completion of Western railroad lines. Not only did the railroads make it easier for migrants to travel West, but it also stimulated the various frontiers that attracted people to the West in the first place. The mining, cattle, and farming frontiers would not have been possible if they weren't linked to Eastern markets willing to buy their goods and resources. Secondly, the general trend throughout the settlement of the West was the development of big industries similar to those in the East that we've already talked about. We tend to think of the West as a land of cowboys and rugged individualism. And while many of the early pioneers were self-sufficient, in every frontier, small independent miners, cattle ranchers, and farmers gave way to larger commercial production. For example, once all the most accessible gold was discovered in places like California and Nevada, small prospectors were replaced by large companies that used hydraulic mining to get to the hard to reach gold and silver. This process was expensive and required a great deal of machinery and capital investment, something that the average person could not afford. The same was true of the farming frontier. The homesteaders with their 160 acres of land could not compete with the large commercial farmers that controlled thousands of acres of land. These larger farmers were able to afford new machinery, such as the um, earliest combine, such as the McCormick harvester and twine binder. And they were able to create huge food surpluses for the industrializing nation. 
Even the cowboy gave way to large cattle ranchers who were able to breed and raise thousands of cattle to ship to Chicago stockyards. Therefore, when we think of the process of industrialization, we need to realize that this was a national phenomenon and not just one that was occurring in Eastern cities. Now, lastly, mm -hmm. it is important to acknowledge the myth of the West and Frederick Jackson's uh, Turner's frontier thesis. The Wild West still lives on in American popular culture, and there is perhaps no more iconic image of America than the cowboy itself, who uh, was considered the ultimate representation of manliness and rugged individualism. Now, we think of these individuals who are usually portrayed by Hollywood as being white as the real conquerors of the frontier. However, the cowboy is only a small part of the story of the last West. In reality, the Western frontier was closed by a diverse group of Americans. Uh, for example, the earliest cowboys were Mexican, and many American cowboys actually learned the trade from Mexican vaqueros who had come before them. When the gold rush hit, um, a, a large number of immigrants to California were ch from China. These Chinese workers were not only integral to the mining frontier, but they also helped build the transcontinental railroads. Women carved out a life for themselves in the West as well. Women ran shops and boarding houses in the boom towns and cow towns that popped up on the frontier. These women not only earned greater economic equality uh, than their Eastern counterparts, but they also enjoyed greater political rights as well. Western states like Wyoming gave women the right to vote long before the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution. The farming frontier was perhaps the most diverse, drawing families from all over the country. Many African Americans seeing a loss of economic opportunities in the New South because of sharecropping and Jim Crow chose to take advantage of the Homestead Act. In 1879, 6,000 freedmen left the South and traveled to Kansas hoping for a better life. These freedmen became known as exodusters, and they helped settle the farming frontier. And of course, all of this doesn't even take into account the large number of Mexicans who became part of the United States after the uh, Mexican session in 1848, or the 350,000 Native Americans who lived in the West in the 1860. Now, both of these groups would also play a major role in the development of the region, too. So the story of the West is essential to our understanding of the United States. The closing of the West would not end the restlessness and mobility tied to the American character. And the search for new frontiers, economic opportunities, will cause Americans to look to new lands beyond the continental United States by the end of the century, leading us to a new chapter of imperialism, which we'll talk about later. But that's a story for another time. Take care.